The uh, Playboy Key Club takes great pleasure in presenting a bright new comedy team. The editors of Playboy magazine regard this act as one of the year's most promising discoveries. Ladies and gentlemen, here they are, Burns and Carla. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Burns. This is my partner, Mr. George Carlin. If there are two things in life that we as individuals, George and myself, dislike intensely, uh, one of them is the jelly you'll find on the other side of the soap if you leave it in the dish overnight. The other, women's clubs. Uh, my feelings were engendered by the fact that my mother, a wonderful woman, was president of a women's club while I was growing up. As I say, she was wonderful, but slightly misguided. She was fighting for recognition of Red China. This was in 38. <laughs> So we'd like to show you now a meeting of the Southgate Mothers Club on a Monday afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the Southgate Mothers Club. Before we start the usual business on the agenda, I want that all of you should observe a moment of silence and compassion for Mrs. Tompkins. Mrs. Tompkins' kid, Humberto, was picked up this morning on a murder one rap. Now we know that Mrs. Tompkins has not had a lot of time to spend at home with her kids. She's been very busy on the juvenile delinquency committee. <laughs> all right, now to the usual business. First of all, a report on next weekend's activities from our next weekend's activities reporter. Very happy to have Agnes once again. Here she is, Agnes once again. Thank you very much, Miss President. Well, of course, next weekend is our annual fudge fair. Now we hold the fudge fair each year at this time to gather enough money to get the needy children of the neighborhood out of the neighborhood for the summer. If it were possible, we'd like to get them out for the winter, too. <laughs> now, I found a lovely tract of land that we can establish our summer camp on, and I think, I think we could fill it with ropes and boards an abandoned icebox or two, some plastic bags. <laughs> and they can play to their little ethnic heart's content. Now, another little bonus, the edge of the Southgate River runs right near the camp. Except during flood season, then it inundates the camp. The camp will be held during flood season this year. <laughs> so that's it, and I would like to remind you girls, fudge. I think it behooves us all to get out and push the fudge. Now, next of all, we got a book review by a very well-known book reviewer in this area, Miss Thelma Reese from the Van Nuys Times. Mm -hmm. Here she is, Thelma. Mm, she's wonderful. Thank you very much. Books live. Books are vibrant and alive. Now, the book I have chosen to review for you this afternoon is about two brothers. The book is called The Two Brothers. It deals with a set of Siamese twins joined at the lips. <laughs> the boys are raised in the dumbwaiter shaft of a home for unwed mothers. <laughs> After struggling through puberty, the boys are separated following a series of successful operations at the Mayo Clinic. Oh, not the Mayo Clinic, but a clinic run by a Dr. Virginia Mayo head of a local illegal operation of the month club in their neighborhood. <laughs> now then, after the operation, the boys move apart. One moves to Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The other to La Jolla, California. The first portion of the book deals with the letters the boys write to one another. And they do write back and forth, forth and back, one to the other, each to his brother. The first 500 pages of the book drag considerably, but the book ends in a virtual whirlwind of activity as the older brother, Raoul, living in sin with a male model, <laughs> sends an airmail letter to his brother, Congolia, who at that time is gainfully employed as a prompter in a Christian science reading room in Elsinore, California. <laughs> Now then, Raoul forgets to put a stamp on the envelope. The letter is returned to him forthwith, and the book ends on that note. Oh, God. <laughs> Four stars. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, too, Thelma, for a very fine book report. Okay, now to kind of wind things up, and we do want to hustle it along so we can get down to Charlie's before he closes. We got next to all a report on next week's guest speaker. And that, of course, will be reported by our next weekend's guest speaker reporter. Here is Eileen. Eileen. Thank you very much. Well, next weekend is also our Bonds for Israel weekend. Our guest speaker was to have been a Mr. Adolf Eichmann. <laughs> However, Mr. Eichmann has an indefinite booking in the Middle East. <laughs> That's showbiz. <laughs> so in his stead, we have a lovely young lady from the State Hygienic Board, Mrs. Phyllis Carswell. Her subject will be sex play among our children between six and nine, and again between nine and midnight. <laughs> Good evening, sport fans. Biff Burns back again in the Sportlight Spotlight. And my guest tonight, a young man who has been a credit to the boxing game for over 20 years. A young man who was recently called by Ring Magazine, one of America's boxers. <laughs> I'd like to introduce him to you now, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Carlin. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Biff. It's a pleasure to be on your crummy show. <laughs> thank you, Killer. Listen, uh, could you tell me, Killer, how your fabulous boxing career started? Well, I started boxing as a kid in uh, my neighborhood, in the Lower East Side in New York. One day I was sitting at home, my mother asked me to take the garbage out. So I punched her in the mouth. <laughs> my old man seen it, he says, kid, you got a good right hand. How would you like to make a little money in a fight game? So I made my decision. I called Mitch Miller and I canceled my oboe lessons. <laughs> Then we went into training. Of course, we didn't have a lot of money at that time. We had to keep my mother on as a sparring partner. That didn't work out too good, though. She kept falling out of the wheelchair. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, it's a fabulous beginning, killer. A fabulous beginning. Do you recall your first fight? Oh, sure. That was against Slugger Hogan. Used to call him the Mad Mick. Oh, yeah. He had quite an impressive record, as I recall. Yeah, he did have quite a record. I think he did 15 years at Leavenworth. <laughs> Picked him up in Sweden for boxing in the nude. Oh, well, that's a terrible charge, but... You recall now that night of the first fight, your first professional fight, killer? Oh, I certainly do. I remember that. I can never forget it. The lights were shining down. The crowd was out there and were yelling. I threw a left and a right, a left and a right, a couple of more combinations, a couple of lefts and then a right, and an uppercut and a left and a right and an uppercut like that. It was great. Then Hogan came out of the dressing room, down the aisle, and into the ring, and the fight started. <laughs> But uh, we got our signals a little crossed there, you know. Everybody's falling down all over the ring. Nobody's throwing any punches. They're just falling down. <laughs> Even a referee took a dive just to be on the safe side. Sure. Never know who's in the audience. One of the shortest boxing matches in history, as I recall, Killer. Yeah, that's right. Just 30 seconds. Just time enough to move a couple of Gillette razors and a few blades, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. now, Killer, you have had over 220 professional boxing matches. That many, huh? Yes, that many. Yeah. And you have uh, yet to win one. No, that's not true. That's not true. I won a fight back in 1947. Look, uh, Killer, before we sign off tonight, I wonder if you have a few words of wisdom to pass along to the kids that are watching us on Coast to Coast TV tonight. They may want to be boxers, too. Oh, well, that's fine. Kids, if you want to be boxers, the main thing you got to remember at all times, stay physical. You know, it's very important. Get the proper food, balanced diet, get eight hours sleep every night, and get good exercise. And above all, don't let your body rot. You know, a lot of kids have a tendency to let their bodies rot, you know? Rotten little kids is what you are. I know, you're a bunch of rotten uh, kids. Good night, sport fans. Good night. <laughs> There's another type of television show that comes on your screen every afternoon. It's directed primarily toward the children. And they call them, of course, kiddie shows. People come out with, you know, insipid sayings and funny hats. We'd like to give you our version of a children's show for hip kitties, and we call it Captain Jack and Jolly George. Hi, kids, it's time for Captain Jack, that's me! And Jolly George, that's me! Hey, 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 what a show we got for you today! Oh, boy, we always have a good show for you, don't we, kids? Not like watching that square old Miss Dingling or anything yeah. like that, huh? Hey, kids! Kids, remember yesterday on Cartoon Time? Yeah, yeah. We left Clarabelle the Clown and Hermie the Hermaphrodite all hung up in the back room. 
You see, what they were trying to do, they tried to hide the booze before Clarabelle's mommy came in. Yeah. yeah. Hey, now how about you kids out there? You managed to get the booze hidden before mommy staggers home? Oh, let's watch that now. Mommy don't want to see you getting smashed, too. I'll tell you what you do, kids. You watch and see where daddy hides his booze, and then you put yours in the same place. And then if she finds it, he gets busted, not you. See? Yeah. It's so much fun seeing daddy get all hung up like that. Yeah. Hey, kids. Kids, today... Today is absolutely the last day to send for your Cat and Jack and Jolly George Jr. Junkie Kid. Right. You've got to have this kid. Oh, boy. You've got to have it. And why is this the last day? I'll tell you why, kids. We were down at Tijuana, and our dealer has been busted by the fuzz. Yeah. So we're running just a little short of the stuff, kids. Right. Tell you. Now, of course, this is pure heroin you get. I mean pure heroin. No milk, sugar, no preservative, no flour added. Oh, it no. is dynamite. I'll tell you, kids. Captain Jack and I shared a half a bag, shot it up just before the show. Oh, I'm t- I'll tell you, I'm twisted, kids. Look, look at my eyes, huh? One taste. One taste, kids, and I'm stoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Now, of course, in the kit, you also get a U.S. Army surplus 12cc hypodermic needle. That's right. And you get a genuine Rogers Silverware 1812 bent spoon. Yeah, that's to mix the fix, kids. And that spoon. Yeah, hey, he knows, huh? Sure thing. And I'll tell you what, kids, that spoon is available in modern, traditional, provincial, or rosemary. Yeah. Make sure you specify which pattern you want when that's you send right. in, kids. And, of course, you get 3,669 feet of rubber tubing to wrap around your arm get that vein popping. Yeah. Out there. That's out there. Hey, that's important. Yeah. Hey, yeah. not only that, kid, you know what else you get? You get a 30-day supply of cotton to keep the spike clean. You know, don't want to get an abscess vein. You know, Captain Jack, we had a lot of letters from kids. They're shooting up with a dirty spike and they're getting an abscess vein. Oh, oh now, kids, I'll tell you what you do. You keep that spike clean. And when you see that big bluish purple splotch creeping up your arm, kid, it's time to switch to the main vein. Right back there, kid. That's it, kid. Oh, that's a wonderful spot. Now, for the first 250 kids that send in for their kit, you're going to get a bonus, and that bonus is... A genuine 8 by 10 autographed glossy picture of Alexander King. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You can hang it right beside Mummy's picture. Yeah. Okay. Now, here, for your kit, you send to Captain Jack and Jolly George, care of Pusher, Hollywood 28, California. Yeah. In New York, call Withdrawal Symptoms 58964. <laughs> okay, kids, it's time for milk. Milk oh. drinking time on the Captain Jack and Jolly George show. Gotta drink your milk with us, kids. Mm. Mm. Boy, that's good. Now, don't forget, kids, you never outgrow your need for milk. You keep asking Mommy for milk. It's amber-colored, and it comes in a tall brown bottle with a picture of a white horsey on it. Yeah. Yeah. You love it. You love it. Now, this is for the little girls. Uh-oh. Oh, little yeah. Little boys, out of the room. Little girls only. That's right. Today is your next to last day to send for your Lolita kit. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. You see, in this kit, you get, of course, an autographed picture of Vladimir Novikov and the original Lolita. Hey, yeah, and I'll tell you, also get a little instruction booklet in there, girls. And you know something? If you girls read those instructions and do the exercises <laughs> prescribed, <laughs> that's kind of fun in itself, girls. <laughs> I'll tell you what, in just two weeks, you'll be walking and talking and acting like girls twice your age. And you can pick up a little cash after school. You know? Yeah! Why not? Huh? Okay, kids, as we do every day, we want to leave you with our thought for the day. Above all, don't, don't forget, forget to pray. pray. Night, kitty. Any shift in our foreign policy is evidenced many times by the motion pictures you see on your television screen. For instance, during World War II, we were motivated by chauvinistic and nationalistic purpose, and we had some great war films. Uh, Today, our policy has changed. We have the United Nations, and we're living with the threat of the bomb. So we'd like to show you two motion pictures, one as it would have been filmed during World War II, the other as it would be filmed today. The World War II film is first, the scene somewhere in the South Pacific on a Japanese-held island. Babe, Ruth stinks! Hey, Lieutenant, you hear what the enemy said about the babe? You hear that? Dirty, rotten, slimy, sneaky, low-down, sniveling, yellow-bellied... Ah! Jap? German? Italian? Who else we fighting? Easy. There must be somebody else. Easy, boy. There's a lot of them out there. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. You can't see them, no. but they're out there. Mm-hmm. Hey! Hey, Sarge, it's me, Bob! I'm wounded! Help me! Hey, Lieutenant, that sounds like Bob out there, like we ought to help him or something, like he's in trouble. Now, wait a second, that could be the enemy, how tricky they are. Yeah. You know, Orientals have trouble pronouncing words where the letters R in them. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's ask him a question with a lot of R's in it. What, what was the name of that game we used to play when we were kids, the ring thing? Oh, I know, I know, I got it. 
What's the name of the children's game where everyone forms a circle and dances around the one in the middle? Lingle on the lozy. <laughs> well, that's what we call it in my neighborhood. I realize that, Sergeant Wong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're in a, a heck of a spot here. Yeah. Surrounded on all sides, outnumbered at least ten to one, just two of us left. Sergeant? Yeah? Do we surrender? Or do we attack? Lieutenant, we launch our own frontal assault. We go get one for Goldberg, we get one for O'Brien, one for Terrazini, one for Drumbowski, one for Peterson, and one for Robinson. We get one so we can have chocolate sodas all over America, and we get one for Mom. You hear that? You hear that? Let's get one for Philip Wiley's mother! Yeah, yeah, Come on! Yeah, over the top! Yeah. Let's go, everybody! Get him! <laughs> well, that's the way it would have been during World War II. Now, today, as I say, our policy has changed, and that film would come out on your theater screen looking something like this. Mickey Mantle's a sucker for a curveball. Hey, that boy's been reading Sports Illustrated. <laughs> yes, they're very well informed, the adversary. I don't think we should ever underestimate them. In fact, they've taken giant steps in their educational system, passing our own secondary system in many instances. Well, better schools are everybody's job. I think we should all give now to the colleges of our choice. Good advice, Sergeant. Someday you'll be a lieutenant. Hey! Hey, Sergeant, it's me, Bob. I'm wounded. I sound a little you like Bob, like he's in trouble or something. It could be. Now, I didn't see him at the chow hall tonight. He lost his diner's club card. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be the enemy. Yeah. You know how yeah. tricky they are, devil oh, may care. Yeah. Uh, why don't you ask him a question? Okay, let's see what's going on, huh? Yeah. Who's running for president? Warren Harding. Yeah, that's Bob, all right. Mm. Yeah. Good luck, Bob. <laughs> He'll make it. He's a champ. <laughs> you know, we're in a pretty precarious position here, Sergeant. I know that. Ammunition's gone. Medical supplies are low. Just two of us left. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest we do? Surrender or attack or what? Well, Lieutenant... I don't feel that two groups of men, just because they're on opposite ends of the political and ideological ladder, should be made to come together in armed conflict. I feel that steps are being taken now within the framework of the United Nations that will one day lead to a worldwide brotherhood of man. Men of every race, color, and creed will walk side by side through a world based and founded on peace and equality. Work is being started by great leaders at this time. Eleanor Roosevelt, David Ben-Gurion, Carlos Romulos, Ed Sullivan, Bobby Darin, Stan Musial, Mickey Mantle, Sid Ziff, Robert Hall. Back in the 40s, and in the early 50s, a new generation was spawned. It was called by the Boswells of that era, people like Jack Kerouac and Arnold Ginsberg, the Beat Generation. We'd like to give you our impression now, of the last of the Beat Generation, in a vignette called The Cool World of Herb Coolhouse. find that guy again. Pretty wild stuff there. Five foot three and no bammies. Use your Bank America card, too. My name is Amos Morphy. You know? Amos Morphy. And this is my partner, Herb Coolhouse. Herb is a, an angry poet. And uh, I'm a fairly salty bongo player. And everything is groovy, right? Everybody high? Mm -hmm. Everything all right? Yeah. Oh, man. That K 
chat up near the vent must be stone, huh? <laughs> hey, if the waitress comes around to your table, order one of these. Look for the Mexican emblem. Watch the real thing in smoking pleasure. The honest taste of pot. <laughs> All right, man, so everything's groovy. Everybody's high, right? All right. Me and Herb made an album, you know? We made an album, and, uh, and we made it on the irate label. It was reviewed in Downbeat Magazine last week by Leonard Feather. Leonard Feather said, this is undoubtedly the worst piece of trash ever recorded. <laughs> well, we all know what a fink Leonard Feather is. <laughs> so I think his comments speak well for Herb's work. And everybody's high, right? <laughs> you know, I think we ought to recognize Red China. <laughs> They grow some wild stuff over there. <laughs> Goofy farmers. No wonder their foreign policy is all fouled up. Everybody's high. <laughs> Agrarian reform, my eye. They're growing pot over there, man. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to do a little number from the album for you, man. Uh, Herb will recite a poem, and I will accompany him on the bongos, as I am wont to do. Listen closely now as Herb recites, very closely, and see if you don't notice a certain God-like quality. He's just like God, man. <laughs> just him. Uh, okay, cool it now. I don't. I got a headache. I call my biting work Ode to a Texaco restroom On alternate US 101 South I have traveled all over this stinking world And I've seen all you dirty Stinking Naked people I've seen you in your dirty, stinking, shiny sports cars. And you are dirty, and stinking, and naked. And naked, and dirty, and stinking. Parker and that punch. <laughs> Your naked dirt stinks. <laughs> there is so much dirt in the world, and I have seen it all. It is all on me. <laughs> it is not clean dirt, like they have in Iowa, but dirty dirt. Like they have in Toledo. Toledo stinks, and it's naked. Soon the dirty, stinking dirt will inherit the earth, and we'll all be dirty, and stinking, and naked, and like that. <laughs> Besides, with that infrared seat that keeps flying up at you, how can you rest in a Texaco restroom? Later. <laughs> there are very few quality programs left on television today. One of them happens to be an interview program. It was at one time hosted by Ed Murrow. It is today hosted by Charles Collingwood. Ed is on a sabbatical leave. He had a choice of taking a sabbatical or taking over Queen for a day. So we took the coward's way out. We'd like to show you now the original person to person. Good evening. My name, Ed Murrow. The name of the show, Person to Person. Tonight, our guest 
his party's front runner for the presidential nomination, Senator Chester Freebich. Senator Freebich lives in this modest 40 room bungalow, <laughs> financed with the aid of a GI loan. It has 18 bedrooms, 22 bathrooms. The senator has a problem. I hope he'll be with us for the entire show. <laughs> Good evening, Senator Freebish, and welcome to Person to Person. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Ed, and uh, welcome to Person to Person. The senator, with the convention upcoming, you must, of course, be rather nervous. Yeah, that's true. Most of your party professionals get a little nervous around convention time, Ed. Of course, this year, the American Legion convention's being held in Palm Springs, which I don't understand. There's not much happening there. No place to fill the water pistols, you know. All the girls are carrying health cards, too. Uh, you know. No, that's not what I meant, <laughs> Senator. I meant the Democratic National Convention being held in Los Angeles. Yeah, I know that. Well, Senator, as I recall, you are not even a member of the American Legion, are you? No, as a matter of fact, that I'm not. The uh, Legion won't have me in, uh, in the ranks, you know. Just another black mark on their record, the way I look at it. But uh, they're a little leery about that incident during the war. You oh, know, yes. Nothing at all. I recall that incident during the war very well. Yeah, I thought you would, Ed. That, um, that was the time that you were broadcasting to American troops from Berlin, yeah. advising them to surrender a week before VE Day. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little case of bad timing, Ed, that's all. You know, a little bad timing. <laughs> It certainly was. Do you think that charge will be brought up against you by your opponents? Well, they better not, I'll tell you that. I got plenty on some of them. I know about that one watching tonight with the high forehead out there. I know about you uh, and your wife in the Capitol cloakroom there, Senator Green, 92 years old. Uh, Poor guy's got a bad heart. Uh, I know all about Senator, it. Capitol cloakroom. Senator, I please. I know all about uh, it. Senator. Yeah. Are we still on? Uh, Senator, no personalities, please. That's another thing. He's got no personality, that one. I know all about yes. it. His wife is all right, though. I'll tell um, you that. Up tune, cha cha cha. Shabbatoon. Senator. Yeah, yeah. Now, your supporters, and of course your detractors, say that two things may hold you back from the nomination, your age and your religion. Mm. Could you clear up one thing tonight in the doubts, in the minds of those who may be watching? Yeah. Just how old are you? Well, I'm 18, Ed. Uh, 19, a week from Tuesday. Happy birthday. Thanks a lot, Ed. Now, you say you are not worried about the religious issue, at least you ought not to be. Do you feel that people are less bigoted today than they were, say, during the days of Al Smith? No, I would say uh, at roughly three to five times more bigoted now than ever before. I think bigotry is definitely the coming thing in this country. <laughs> definitely. Organized bigotry with great leaders like John Casper and Norval Faubus and people like that to carry on the fight why I just think that the wave of the future in this country is organized yes, bigotry. Yes, that's fine. Or so I'm not worried at all about religion, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, apparently not. What have you done about the religious issue? Well, I've done the only thing that a man of any moral fiber can do. I've renounced my religion. Well, I don't think that the Rosicrucians are going to miss me. You know, I never got to many of the meetings. I never bought the stupid cookies. I don't know nothing about it. I don't even know what Amwork means. I just cut the coupon out of a dirty book, you know what I mean? Yes, well, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator. Good night and good luck. Keep swinging, Ed, you know. Just good keep night. swinging. We'd uh, like you to meet a couple of friends of ours right now. A couple of gentlemen who started out in rooms similar to this. One of them was called recently in the profile in the New Yorker magazine, the intellectual voice of our era. The other has been called many things, many times, the sickest of the sick comics. We'd like you to meet him first, Mr. Lenny Bruce. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I thought I would do uh, one of the bits for you that I recorded in one of my albums. And uh, if you like it, you can buy the album. But uh, the little story is called The Genie in the Bottle. And it takes place on Hester Street in New York. An old Jewish neighborhood. And the proprietor of the candy store is dusting off the bottles this one morning. And he's cleaning out. She said, I have a few buckets. Just to have him. Hmm. What's in this bottle here? Never seen this bottle before. Hmm. But he's a cockroach in there, too. <laughs> Who are you? I'm the genie. You come from this neighborhood? I'm the genie, old man. A wondrous man. You have freed me from my glass prison. One wish, any wish, and it is yours. Hmm. Well, I'd like to have a little income property. A room, it's yours. And all at once, the room filled up with 15 beautiful women. <laughs> 
One more wish. Any wish, old man, then it is yours. Hmm. Well, I'd like to go to Atlantic City. Go. We'll take care of the star. I will. You can take care of a candy star. The genie, I can do anything. All right, I'll go. But don't give no credit to the Schwartzes. <laughs> so the old man goes to Atlantic City and he has a wonderful time. And the genie takes good care of the store. He brings in the Mary Janes and the guess what's and the rolls and the milk, you know. The next morning, the people are filing into the store. So there's Sal. He went to Atlantic City. Who's taking care of the store? I am. You can take care of a candy store. The genie, I can do anything. All right, make me a malted. Ba-boom, you're a malted. <laughs> Another good friend of ours is here tonight, Mort Saul. All right, good. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, <laughs> forward. Good. Okay, so um, a lot of trouble in the world, right? You know, everybody is all shook up about the Japan riots and the collapse of the summit. In fact, things are so bad, I understand that Brubeck has canceled his tour, right? This usually portends some sort of crisis. You know, generally speaking, in the Middle East, but I think he's divorced himself now from that Arab League thing. He's expanding, you know, taking in Northern Europe and uh, Eastern Asia, you know, that's important. And uh, I think better understanding is coming out of all of this, right? Good. Okay, so forward, right. Uh, back to the premise. Uh, Japan, a lot of trouble over there, right, with the riots and, the, you know, the snake thing. All right, so good. All right, here's the scene. They're rioting all over. They're rioting in South Korea, in Turkey, in Japan, and it's always these students, right? The students are the ones that do all the rioting, right? All right, good, okay. All right, I want to talk more about that later anyway, the student and his role. Okay, so, all right, the students, but they figure, you know, it's June, right? The exams are over, school is out, let's riot. Good, right, before we go away. Last time together, it's kind of a camaraderie thing, right? So, we'll all riot. Here's two students in Japan talking, right? Let's see. Well, what did you do in uh, philosophy? Well, I, I got 95, you know, all right, that's cool. What did you get in rioting? Well, not so good. I missed finals. I only got a 65. I didn't even know Haggerty was in town, you know? Right? Good. Okay. All right. So, well, that's okay. Gee whiz. You can make it up uh, this summer in a summer session, right? Christian Herter's coming over in August. Good. Okay. He's always good for two semester hours on the circuit, right? Okay. Good. <laughs> good. 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 All right, talk more about that later. And Christian Herter and his problems and so forth and his trip down from Massachusetts. All right. Okay, so good. Oh, by the way, uh, is there anyone I haven't offended yet? Everyone's been offended. Okay, good. All right, back to the premise. Onward, right? Good. Okay, forward. Good. All right. Okay, so anyway, uh, the trip to uh, Japan that Eisenhower was supposed to take was canceled, right? Not by Eisenhower or by this government, but by Kishi, Premier Kishi, in uh, Japan, right? Good, all right, all right. So I'll talk more about that, too. I want to talk about Japanese government later on. We'll get back and talk about it in depth, right? Okay, so anyway, Eisenhower did not know the trip had been canceled. He was in Manila at the time, watching a special screening of Back to Bataan. <laughs> Trying to get in the mood for the trip, right? And he was told, he was told that the Japanese students are going to all lie on the runway so that his plane can't land. So he said, well, we're going to land anyway, because I really want to impress these people. You know? <laughs> right, good. <laughs> Into the cement. Kind of a Grauman's Japanese theater thing they have over there. It's a latent suicidal tendency among the Orientals there with the forefathers. I want to talk more about that later, Oriental religions and their place in the ecclesiastical history of man and so forth. Anyway, right, okay, we'll get back to that later. Good. All right, just one more thing about Japan here. They did have a lot of trouble, but they have said that although Eisenhower was not welcome, Jack Parr is. Right, he was over there recently for NBC. Jack Parr, you're always welcome, they said, but if you come over, make sure you bring General MacArthur with you. They have this thing in Japan. They want to see General MacArthur and Jack Parr walking in off the water together. Right? All right. Good. Thank you very much.